Well, after all these years, it is certainly a blessing that we can be together. And I want to tell you how deeply I appreciate your wonderful friendship and your wonderful support and cooperation over all these years. May all of you have a truly wonderful Christmas, and may we all together in the new year see a real advancement on all levels of society of the dreams and principles which we know to be true. Bless all of you. And some time ago, uh, Jowett, who is one of the principal translators of Plato, uh, commenting on the writings of Homer, said that he believed that Homer wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad before the establishment of the Greek mysteries. This seems unlikely, however, because much of the story that has come down to us from so many different sources is to be found in a short section of Homer's work called The Cave of the Nymphs. This is the story of the mysterious cavern presided over by immortal mortals. This cave was at an entrance into birth, and all creatures were born with the sun in cancer. They then entered into the mysteries of the cave, descended to its lowest parts, ascended a ladder that brought them to the gate of exit in the sign of Capricorn. So in the ancient rites, there's no question that Homer was aware of some of the esoteric speculations of far Asia and of the earlier Western cultures. This today we are worshipping, recognizing, and reviving one of the most ancient beliefs of mankind, the annual birthday of the sun. This has been regarded with sacredness from time immemorial. There is no people anywhere that has not passed through some phase of solar symbolism in their philosophies, their sciences, and their theologies. It has dominated all the arts. It has become involved in all harmonic theories of music. And the annual birthday of the sun is the most celebrated and sacred of all festivals throughout the world. We find records of it everywhere because it represents to the average believer the annual restoration of life and becomes a symbol of the grand resurrection in which all things in all conditions and all types of existence come finally to the great redemption, to the restoration, to the lifting up of all life from darkness to light. It is obvious that this belief originated in the northern hemisphere because all of the calculations, symbolisms, and devices involved in the rites are obviously related to a sun motion from the lower to the northern hemisphere of light. So here somewhere, maybe in India, maybe in China, this concept regained its most primitive acceptance. But very pre premier times, when there was nothing but savagery in the world, where men feared darkness and lived only in light, where night was a terror and day a resurrection and a relief. All of these facts and principles and ideas have come down to us in our modern philosophies, our modern religions, and even to a touch of our modern sciences. Because so much of knowledge has been based upon an astronomical mystery, the mystery of the calendar, the mystery of time and of days, the cycles of years, the feasts and various rituals attendant upon various seasons of the year, the harvest, the planting, all of these things were controlled by a fixed system of religion. All of the good things of earth come from one good thing, which is life itself. 
Now the sun in its beginnings came to be understood or recognized as synonymous with life. That which the sun represented was alive. The sun was alive. And because it was alive, it could give life. It could propagate life. It could restore life. It could revive the lives and thing of things that were fading or failing. The sun was basically life. And this life was the common property of us all. The great benefit, the immense gift, the unchallenged mightiness upon which we all depend. From the tiniest atom to the greatest star, light is a symbol of the presence of life. Therefore, this light is a promise. It tells us something that we must all come to understand, that this light is not something that came from nothing. It is not something which was suddenly lit in some generation or age. It was eternal. Therefore, life is eternal. Immortality is a certainty. Growth is inevitable. For all good things, all revelations, are based upon the immediate and inevitable and eternal presence of life. Life is therefore a very sacred thing. And as we watch its descent through all the orders of creation, we find that it comes finally uh, to become shared with the human being. There is life in us. And this life in us has built its tabernacle of the flesh. It is this inner life that moves all parts of the outer life. Because it's without this light, this tremendous power, all futility would go on forever hopelessly. Therefore, we have great important thought of the importance of life. Therefore, every scripture in the world has told us to protect life. It has told us and warned us not to destroy life, rather not to destroy the houses which it builds, to cooperate with it. For within this light, we also have all the laws of light. And the laws of light are the commandments. They are the ways, they are the principles, they are the methods by means of which light accomplishes its perfect works. Therefore, to da damage or destroy the channels of light, or the channels of life, such is a serious crime against eternity. Therefore, we must also remember that in the religions of mankind, there was a basic nature worship. Now, nature worship is not exactly what we sometimes think it is, in terms of nature cults and things of this nature. Nature worship is the adoration of the realities of things. It is to look out upon the great breadth and depths of existence with gratitude, with humble wonder, and with a deep and abiding resolution to learn the lessons of light and life, that we may in due time become useful and valuable servants in this house of eternal effulgency. All religions, then, have had their light gods, and these light gods are all love gods. They are deities that protect, preserve, and uh, ele elevate, lift up, and redeem every form of life in nature. Among the most interesting, perhaps, of these light gods and life gods was Horus, the beloved son of Osiris, the god of the Egyptians. The story of the, of the rites of the Egyptian mysteries, our, the story is so similar to our own that it does, does not pay us to overlook it because it also contains certain secrets as these are set forth in the ancient rites and rituals of the rites of Memphis. In the days of long ago, Osiris, the father god, the principal eternal light, the, root, the guardian and protector of peoples and nations and races, uh, decided that the time had come to establish a covenant upon the earth. And he sent to the earth his only begotten son, 
for us. The, the firstborn of the light God. And this Horus became the defender of the faith and established the mysteries. And the symbol of this deity was the Sambal, the symbol of, of infinite life. And one of the symbols of this deity was the Scarabosacus, the beetle, which was the symbol of the sun itself being rolled across the sky by the eternal power. And Horus became the symbol of the sun deity. And he sat in a ship, and this ship sailed across the sky in the daytime. And at night it went down and sailed through the underworld, so that the spirits in darkness might also have their light. The Egyptians did not know the heliocentric system as we do, but it is interesting that they had become aware of the fact that the sun's light was somewhere when it wasn't here, and regularly came up at the same time according to the seasons. So that instead of say, saying that it was on the other side of the earth, the Egyptians thought of it as in the underworld, or a subterranean part of the world. So that it passed through the darkness and brought peace to the souls that were troubled in the mysterious amentet of the afterlife. And Horus became the avenger of his father. And once Horus became the redeemer, he was the lord of the Shisesti, the lord of the sons of light. And in the great battle between darkness and light, Horus led the hosts of heaven and overcame the dark adversary of winter and brought about in due time the bright light of spring. Everywhere these legends mix and mingle and uh, fall together in patterns that give us a great deal of material for careful thought. Now this light that we know somewhere uh, shining forever has also been distributed through living things as the source of individual life individual light and therefore both life and light come within come within us and the great light life core within us is the human heart and is in the heart that forever the drum of the gods is beating it is also in the heart that the drum of Shiva in India beats out the pulse beat that keeps us alive everywhere we look we find symbols and everywhere we find symbols we find the story of the victorious sun, the mysterious universal light that lighteth everything that cometh into the world. And this life and this power is the life of men. It is the life of all creations. It is distributed through the blades of grass. It goes through every form of life. Therefore, in all analysis, all life is one life. And that one life is the eternal life light itself, the power of the divine in all creation. So as we come to the winter solstice, we come to the time in which the ancients be prepared for the day to come, where they look through the stones of Henge, uh, Stonehenge or watch the shadows of the great pyramids. All these were to tell them the sacred moment the divine instant in which life returned to the world. Now, of course, it is obvious that life did not entirely depart, for if it had, all things would have ended in the black or Kali Yuga of night. It didn't cease. It was diminished. It was diminished, and uh, in this diminishing, uh, left great problems unsolved. It also became a great moral force, for something was going on all the time that some of our forebears recognized that we have more or less forgotten, and namely that the dar darkness or the night is our challenge. The powers of heaven give us light and light. They give us the day with all its glory. But it is in our own hearts and souls that we must transform the night into eternal day. When we do this, we are in the light of reality forever. All these thoughts passed through primitive minds. But these minds were very solemn and we do this, we are in the light of reality forever. All these thoughts passed through primitive minds. But these minds were very solemn and, and sacred in their thinking. 
they tried very hard to realize their utter dependence upon a divine power at the source of existence. They did not believe that they could stand alone. They did not believe that they could turn their backs upon the laws of heaven and build a world of their own. They did not believe in an atheistic culture or anything in which we did not trace our way back to the one truth, the one reality, the one inevitable. On our days, we kind of set aside Christmas as a symbol of giving. And each in his own way, from his own heart, does some giving. The gift of heaven is interpreted in our human lives by the gifts of kindness, by thoughtfulness, by compassion, and by a sharing for a moment some of the realities that have come to our own observation. We find, therefore, the symbol of generosity, and the generosity is the sharing, finally, of life, the sharing of light, the sharing of truth. The greatest gift that we can give to any living thing is a share of the reality that abides within ourselves. So in the old days and so forth and so on, the giving of Christmas, which became identified with St. Nicholas of Myra, uh, was a universal mystery. Christmas was sacred, giving was sacred, sharing was sacred, long before Christianity began. But they did take this, as Irenaeus tells us, and they took the older symbolism and Christianized it. They t explained that in reality, the ancient peoples were, in a sense, Christian people. They had the same teaching, the same essential reality, but they did not call it by the same name. They invented diverse symbols to represent the same truth that was to come to the world at the beginning of the Christian era. And so we have today the descent of the Christmas spirit by means of a psychological, astronomical theology, the symbol of the zodiac, the planets, and the great clock of eternity. If then we have view it in this particular way, we will have some uh, new thinking to do that will be valuable and useful to us. To the ancients, the great mysteries were birth and death. Birth was a coming forth into the obvious. Birth was an embodiment of an eternal life that existed both embodied and unembodied. Birth was a coming into manifestation of invisible principles and powers. Birth was a great and wonderful miracle which the wisest could study and the simplest could comprehend. It was something that was a constant manifestation of unknown realities. Even today, we have no full understanding of the mystery of a life coming into embodiment. We know its physical processes. We can analyze and time the various steps of the procedure. But how it starts in the very beginning? What is the mysterious flash of divine power that in some way comes forth out of the unknown? It is not in the bodies of the parents. It is not in the body of the child. But it is in the body of God. And all creatures, the parents and the child, are in the body of God. It is one mystery specialized in one of the great events of existence, the mystery of birth. And in this birth, the light of heaven begins to shine through. Many mothers have seen it in the eyes of their babies. We see it also as we go along. We see that the child is born close, closer to God than we are. We realize that its thoughts and its ideals and dreams are very wonderful, if fanciful, and in a strange way more practical than ours, and that in our process of trying to help this child to become part of society, we in a way diminish the eternity of it and limit it into the concepts of our own life way. So the child begins, and this is the mystery of the sign of cancer, the entrance to the cave of the mysterious nymph. And then it goes on around the zodiac halfway from Cancer to Capricorn. And in Capricorn we have the symbol of death or transition. 
Now we take it first as a transitional symbol. We see the various energies and resources of life gradually impaired. We find that the time comes when the body can no longer sustain the dreams, the ideals of the spirit. Also that in various ways through ignorance we have damaged that body so that it becomes more and more impaired and that which was to be a temple to the Most High becomes a prison to our own mistakes. These things we have to face. But the time comes when there is a mysterious resurrection which we call death. For death is really the going forth in light according to the Egyptian ritual. To come forth by day is to come forth out of the darkness of our own limitations into the light of eternal truth. And beyond the grave, according to the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Persians, and the Chinese, there was not darkness, but light. All the darkness that there is, is here. And we may immediately depart from it and come forth into the fullness. We come forth into the radiance of the celestial sun. So the Egyptians believed that what we call the Book of the Dead is really a misnomer. And uh, the great Egyptologists of the modern world, like Budge, are aware that it is a misnomer. But the name of this sacred ritual is performed in the rites of the Egyptians of the, the Osirian recension is the book of the coming forth by day. And uh, I know I talked to Dr. Budge Sr. in Chicago years ago when we were discussing the story of the Book of the Dead. And I said to him, Dr. Bustard, is there any evidence that this book was originally a drama, that it was performed by living actors within the precincts of the temples, that it is not simply a discussion of the afterlife, it is a great drama of the life cycle. Bud smiled and he said, it is certainly true, and I have seen copies, manuscripts of the Book of the Dead with the prompter's marks for the actors. It was a living drama, not, mis not merely a strange mythological account of something beyond our general understanding. And in this mystery of coming forth by day, we have the individual who goes forth in the light of truth, that the uh, light within means that we retire not into darkness, but into light. And while the darkness may gather heavy upon the flesh, the more we press on into the mystery, the less darkness there is. And we find that the darkness belongs to this world and not to the eternity. Then we may ask, why are we placed here with this peculiar restriction? Why are so many people living and dying without believing in light? How is it that we struggle from day to day on mass of unsophisticated purposes? How is it that we continue to follow little patterns that lead nowhere and are perfectly content to waste our years rather than to grow? Why do these things happen? And the Egyptians and the Persians and the Hindus have given us a good answer. They have pointed out that we are here just as the small schoolboy says, why do I have to go to school every day when I'd rather go fishing? <laughs> this is it. We would rather have fun. We would rather do nothing important. We would rather lazily go along doing as we please and hoping that everything will come out well. But it doesn't. And it doesn't come out well because it is contrary to the plan of our own existence. The great mystery school, the great center of initiation for man is the human world itself with all that it contains. This earth is our secret house where we must learn how to attain our own conscious immortality. We are here to learn, to grow, and to pass through the rites of life. And these rites are basically three. The right of youth and childhood is the first. The right of maturity is the second. And the right of, a, of age is the third. We move from one level of the mystery to another. And in each level there are lessons to learn. 
and those who learn the lessons graduate. Those who do not learn the lessons continue to drift along in their uncertainties. So in the uh, great cycle of rituals, as broken up into the year, into the day, into the hour, into the minute, all these divisions are significant and have been made into parts of theology by our remote ancestors who lived and struggled and learned and died long before our time. But always the mystery was the same. Always the right was the same. The purpose of life was to grow. The purpose of life was to release the light from within so that instead of depending upon the reformations of physical society, we redeemed ourselves. As Paul says, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is our own inner divinity that must shine forth and lead us on the way of righteousness. We look everywhere for leaders, but the leader we never seem to look for is always here in our own heart. And it is this leader that speaks to us sometimes faintly through conscience and often is silent for many years. Very often in tragedy and great loss we turn to this inner leadership and then we discover that there is balm in Gilead, that from this inner life comes the peace, the security, the understanding which redeems and regenerates the uncertainties of mortality. So here we are with the presence of the Sovereign Son that Akhenaten represented as rays of light, each ending in a human hand. The Son that was no respecter of persons. The Son that was not an autocrat, but was as mindful of the sparrow's fall as it was of the collapse of empire. This ever-present, utter intimacy of life. This life which is a seed, so to say, planted in everything and growing in everything, unless the thing in which it grows turns against it. And all this life has no cash value. It is far more important. We cannot buy it, we cannot sell it. But we can bestow something of it from our own hearts if we so desire. We can comfort, we can help to enlighten, we can serve generously the needs of life but we cannot buy or sell the light of heaven. It does not come out of our intellectualism. It does not come out of our materialism. It is not to be found in the laboratories of science. But the base materials of it are everywhere. And there is nothing that man ever learns, ever studies, or ever believes that in one way or another is not an instrument of eternal light. So on Christmas we come as when the sun moves northward, when the uh, darkness of winter begins to break and we look forward to the promise of another day, we are reasonably certain, even in our most pessimistic moments, that the sun will rise, that the winter will break, that the tiny green things will break through the earth again, that nature will be fruitful, and the human being will be mindful. All these changes are part of a great procedure, a great process. And this process is mentioned in the story of the mysteries of the pyramid, in the house of the hidden places. The pyramid is the symbol of this earth, for its chambers and its inner parts are also symbols of the mysteries of our physical existence. Every mood we have is a room, Every conviction that we nourish puts walls around us or opens them. Every wall is either a divider or a protector. Everything we do has in some way a sacred significance, either directly or by lesson. We learn by doing it well, we learn by doing it poorly. In both cases, learning is inevitable. So as we stand now on the dawn of a very difficult age, a time in which most of our hopes are clouded by the uncertainties that are occurring, when it's sometimes very difficult to keep faith, a time in which most of our hopes are clouded by the uncertainties that are occurring, when it's sometimes very difficult to keep faith with providence, 
to keep our hearts and minds dedicated to those values which are so necessary. In these days, to understand the mystery of the annual birth of the sun, it seems to be especially important. In a few days now, the sun will move northward. When it does so, it will give us the promise of another year. We will make our mistakes, but the grass will grow. We can make all the mistakes we want, but the birds will sing. And we will also make terrible times, but little lives will come into birth through us. Everywhere the great plan goes on, and the human being either forwards it or detracts from its fulfillment. But no matter what we do, good, bad, or indifferent, the great plan goes on. It is larger and deeper and more mysterious than any obstacle that we can build against it. It goes on. It goes on fulfilling itself. In old times, the priesthoods of the ancients were groups of dedicated persons united to help the good word go on, to help to make life rich to bring new persons to the understanding of the great integrities of existence. And out of all these integrities, we've had the commandments of every culture, laws of ethics, rules, rites, and ceremonies. And in ancient times, people were a little bit intimidated because they were told that if they broke these rules, they would suffer. Now, the suffering usually consisted in being rejected by their fellow citizens. But this was not the real meaning of it, or the significance of it. Those who break the rules suffer because they have broken the rules. They suffer because it is inevitable that when we are not consistent with the laws of that light in which we exist, when we cut it off, when we turn our backs to it, when we deny it, or try to corrupt and pervert it into some selfish purpose of our own, then we bring down the strange power that changes the light, as Bailey says, into a consuming fire. Therefore, light is the basis of our growth, and fire is the basis of our purification, as the alchemist pointed out. Every day we are here, we are being tested, not based on, by some arbitrary power, but by our own needs. Within ourselves there are hungers, there are pains, there are mistakes that we constantly suffer from. We wish we didn't make them, but we do. We wish we could get over making them. We can, but we may not. Actually, the whole of our existence is a great initiation ritual, and the grand master of the mysteries is the sun, the great hierophant who controls all the rites and all the symbols. Not the visible sun as we see it in the sky, but as what uh, the Emperor Julianus called the mystery of the sovereign sun and the mother of the gods. The sovereign sun is the ruler whose laws cannot be disobeyed. This is a luminosity. We do not see its principles. But the whole mystery of light is, as Newton found out, completely mathematical, completely lawful. In light is all things. And this light that comes from above, reflected through all forms of creation, turned and crossed over the orbit of the moon, and finally coming down to our earth. This light is a complete work in itself. It is a manuscript with more pages than have ever been written. It is a teacher that teaches more than any sage has ever known. It is a parent more intimate, more kindly, more loving than any physical parent can possibly be. And out of the great eternity of condition, out of the infinite number of things that must be rectified, in this light there is nothing failing, nothing overlooked. The light can reach to the furthest star and into the soul of the tiniest grain of sand. All of it is part of the tremendous dynamic effulgency of this light content. It is something that is so tremendous 
that we can only see the hinges, the fringes of its robes, its own substance is beyond us. So on Christmas Day, we worship, venerate, or adore, in one form or another, by one faith or another, by one system or another, the same mystery, the infinite blessing of God's gift of life, of light, of hope, of faith. And these things are indigenous. They are within us. They are not something that has to be taken out of the pages of a holy book. They are in our own hearts. And there, they are available to us at all times. But we celebrate this availability by the great birth of light at Christmas and the resurrection of light at Easter. These are the ancient ceremonies, the ancient symbols. And now with all the problems that we face, it is necessary for us to begin to examine a few of these things. We are surrounded by an infinite amount of abuse. Every resource we have is being threatened. The peace and happiness of mankind is in doubt. We are very much aware of our infirmities, but not aware of the remedy. The remedy lies in the very fact of light itself. It lies in the fact that our adoration for the eternal should be so much greater than our fear of the temporal that we cannot be moved from the foundation of gratitude, understanding, love, and obedience. The law of, of life is like a parent. We must obey. We must, in one way or another, keep the rules of the game. When we do, we are in a magnificent life of peace and security. When we break the rules, disaster descends upon us. We are beginning now, after a number of years of disaster, to consider this matter. We are beginning to feel that there is some relationship between the sky and the infinite and the stars and the sun and the moon and our little puny existence down here on a little ball rolling through space. We begin to realize that we are citizens of a vast universe whose rules we must obey. And uh, we are here not simply to conquer this universe. We are here not to take its resources and exploit them. We are not here to get rich off of what nature has provided. Because if we were, and it was lawful, we would not have to leave all of it behind when we go. We can only take with us that which we have achieved in union with life itself. And so on this season, the experience of light, the experience of life, should be very close to us. And it is properly represented by generosity, by the individual sharing instead of hoarding, the individual giving instead of taking, the individual who realizes that it is better to love than to be loved. This all is part of a great story, a great reality. And the, the whole hope, the whole principle of it, the whole privilege of it, is returned to us through the mystery of the winter solstice. Here, the a necessary uh, extra something is bestowed. In the winter, the world is like the body of things. It is like our physical bodies. In, in the darkness of winter, the bodies become objects of fear, the objects of abuse, the objects of terror, and crime stalks the darkness. In the light, however, the body becomes a symbol of radiance and luminosity. If we are limited to the body, we dwell in night. If we sustain our realities, and survive the mysteries of our problems, then we ascend from body into unity with life itself. There is only one life. Therefore, there can be only one creature. And all the infinite diversities that we know, from the greatest to the smallest, are parts of one eternal family, 
a family that is forever here, a family in which we can have good relations or bad relations according to our own conduct. This is a family which we have not yet discovered to be a brotherhood or a sisterhood. We are not sure that those far away understand us, and probably they don't. But it is also true that the law says they must and we must. There is no end to problem, no solution to the mystery of existence, except the restoration of the unity of life and the realization of the oneness of all created things. This means that all our natural resources must be used lovingly and unselfishly, that we are not permitted by nature to amass anything that is destructive to another person, that we are not allowed to be selfish with impunity. Everywhere we turn, the law works, and the law is love. And without that law, the great realities can never be revealed to us. We will invent many things and abuse them because we have no love. We will do much in research into the depths of nature, but it will be for profit and not for principle, and all will fail. Every device that we invent as a commodity, a convenience, or a new revelation of skills will remain a danger, a hazard, and a constant problem until it is used as the eternal demands that it be used. We cannot use it any other way and survive. And we have to do the same thing with our own lives. If we maintain our grudges and antagonisms, if we find a certain satisfaction in hurting the feelings of others, if we blame others for all our troubles and all our misfortunes and pass on to other public officials answers that we must find for ourselves, these things continue to be a problem. We cannot be saved by government. But we can gradually restore the government of the eternal over the temporal. We can restore the government of light. And uh, Thirmar Shah, the great Muslim conqueror, whom we know as Tamerlane, when he became master of the world of his time, he called in his sage and his astronomer and said, I want you to design for me a government in, based entirely upon the government of the heavens. I want to have a cabinet. I want to have a solar system of leaders. I want constellations of technicians and of skilled people. I want everything there is in the solar system set forth as a department of human society. It was a great challenge, but there was something in it that probably even Tamerlane uh, did not understand. But the my mysterious dark sage who he communicated with set him up a pattern that did survive for some time, a pattern based upon the fact that all parts of a solar system or all parts of a government must be united in a common purpose and that all of the different branches must be equally enlightened, equally dedicated, and equally desirous of sharing all that is necessary for the common good. This was a great idea and a great challenge, but it comes back to us today. We are gradually, in spite of ourselves, deciding to return the world to its, to its creator. We cannot handle the situation. We were never intended to. We were intended to use the experiences of this world to learn how to handle ourselves, how to become real people, how to do all the things that were necessary to the infusion of realities. And in failing to do this, we have come in time to a grave difficulty. And so on Christmas at this time, we hope that each one of you will be given thank you, a special consideration. And so on Christmas at this time, we hope that each one of you will be given thank you, a special 
consideration uh, to the problem of growth. That by the time we get around to next Christmas, there will be more stars in the terrestrial firmament. That more people will be bound together by the great truths of life. Otherwise, we will find a very strange chemistry occurring. We will find that the instruments for the manifestation of life will gradually deteriorate. The channels will no longer be clear. There will be various stoppages. There will be cholesterol in the psychological arteries of humanity. We will get to the point where we cannot get the blood to the heart, where then we begin to watch the saddest thing of all. Not a sudden departure from here, but a gradual loss of those virtues and values which are most necessary to our personal well-being and to our collective existence. Coming here, you will help the sun in its northward journey uh, to be supported so that each day of the month, as it moves toward the winter solstice, each one of us will have a little more contribution to make. We will not be satisfied simply to take sun baths or take a vacation in the present climate. We will not be happy to allow the sun simply to shine on us while we do nothing. We will rather realize that our purpose is to have the sun shine not on us, but through us, to all that is necessary, to all that is vital, to all that is valuable, to the common good. So to grow up each year with the sun is very important. So that each year we become a little wiser, a little happier, and a little stronger, and more inclined to offer thanks and our various offerings to the sovereign sun. And then when we come finally to the summer solstice, and it begins to fade again, then we suddenly have another descriptive thought. As the sun slowly fades into the winter, it leaves us standing on our own feet. As it grows less day by day, we must supp supplement this loss through our own insights. If it is possible to recognize that in winter, people who are poverty-stricken need help in the form of clothing and food because the seasons are too inclement. In the same way, the soul, functioning in its own needs, requires a little more of our giving when the great sovereignty of the sun fades a little from us. It is as though we were growing into maturity, and little by little the parents who guided us fade away. And as they become less and less capable of guiding and guarding, then we must take over ourselves, take care of our own destinies, and guard and guide those who have loved us. Everything is a sharing, and every year is an opportunity to grow enough to share a little more, to do something better about all these things, rather than to simply drift along from day to day in our old ways. It seems, therefore, that uh, somewhere along the way, we're going to have to get a new theology, in a sense, based upon the interpretation of the vast theology of existence itself. We have created all kinds of religions. Some are good, some are not quite so good. All are mostly sincere. There's no question about it. But there's something that they sort of set them apart. Theology was a branch of learning to be listed with medicine or art or literature or law. Theology was a separate thing to build a separate doctrine or a separate integrity to guide people through the years of life. There was nothing essentially wrong with it. The difficulty with it was it gradually crystallized. It gradually came into a state in which the acceptance of the theology was what helped. And this is not true. It is the living of it. It is the exploring of it. It is the divine examination of all these different values. And the real purpose of theology is to form a ladder up which man can step rung by rung until he can come face to face with reality itself. So in the course of time, this theological structure has lost its vitality. It has lost the realization 
that it was a science of salvation, not merely a series of beliefs. And that when two or more religions lock in some time, kind of horrible animosity, each one claiming to be more kindly than the other, and committing every conceivable crime in the name of the God of love, if this thing, type of thing happens, gradually, little people, ordinary folks, are going to begin to see through the situation. They're going to realize more and more that these great formal structures are crystallized into patterns. Some of these patterns are good. There's no reason why we shouldn't follow the faith of our fathers if we so inclined. But we should take that faith as a means of discovering the faith of our one father, the eternal light from which we come. We must keep faith with truth and life, not merely with an assortment of opinions and beliefs. We must take no shortcuts. We must not try to join something that will save us from our miseries without improving our natures. Everything must be done lawfully and properly. Man is rewarded for his works and not for his promises. He is rewarded for his deeds and not for his pretensions. Each person in his own way is a traveler toward the light. And that light cannot be taken from him. It cannot be obscured by any physical phenomena. It could not even be destroyed or obscured if the planet Earth itself dissolved because this light is eternal. And that which becomes one with it gains eternity with it. That which comes to see it shares it. And little by little the individual who saw only his own backyard gradually begins to see his neighbor's life, and then his country's life, then the world life. Everything comes as the person gains through the experiences of the testing of beliefs with love and understanding. And one of the problems that we have had is the importance of travel. People who have, get, have seen other faiths have a better understanding than those who have been locked always in their own. The more we experience or see or behold or appreciate the dedications, the convictions, the ideals of other people, other nations and other races, the more we suddenly come to realize that all these faiths are one faith, separated only by geography and language. The real facts are always the same, and the facts are the oneness of life, the, are the parenthood of the divine, and the brotherhood of humanity. These are the great truths. These are the things that we should think about a little bit as we come to the Christmas season. For we are about to be given a new opportunity to grow. The gates of the temple will open again, and the processions of the initiates will enter in to experience more testing, more trials, more proofs of integrity. And as their proofs improve, as they show themselves to be more and more worthy, the secrets of the eternal will flow through them. The more we become uh, enlighten, enlightened and awake inwardly, the more we will understand of the universe, the more the great truths of life will shine through uh, to, to strengthen us and create in us a positive dedication. There are some interesting patterns and things that have come down to us from the ancients, including these various rituals, most of which tell us definitely that all ritualism is merely a symbol of life process. Rituals are things that life passes through in the process of becoming and later in the process of bestowing. These two great processes work together. The child born into the world, even in infancy, is passing through in, uh, initiations. The initiation of learning to walk, the initiation of learning to cry, the initiation of lay, depending upon the love of parent and bestowing from itself a strange trustfulness which has not been destroyed by sophistication or abuse. The child's perfect acceptance of life 
reminds us of primitive society that in the beginning did not have the type of mind that censored, divided, was suspicious. And because it was not suspicious, there were no suspicions. The whole thing developed within that child itself. Then came the second initiation into the mysteries, and that was growth. Here we find the child faced by the gradual dawning of its own vital resources. Here we find the child going to school, facing education, facing the various dangers and hazards of gradual acceptance into physical society. Here the child passes through so-called childhood diseases, and most people have them philosophically and religiously also. Strange diseases of uncertainty, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, and antagonism of religious conflicts. These things the child has to learn while it is going to grammar school and taking long lessons in material it will never use because it has no vital significance. But the child has to learn this. But then it goes into the next cycle and having not learned anything too important, it has not been given even the uh, enlightenment that we associate with the Montessori method of training children. Instead of having that child going into its teens with a little firm understanding of basic values, it enters into its emotional adolescence, which is the most dangerous period of its life, with practically no mature help. Here it has to learn. Here it has to pass through all kinds of experiences, some of them very trying, which can gradually become tragic, as we find with young people of today who have to enter this period without any help, with very little understanding and very little preparation. The only thing they can gradually do is learn from experience. They have to go through things until finally, through experience, through constant repetition of error, they come to the realization of what is right and what is good. So they finally pass through this period of life, uh, hoping, struggling, trying uh, to make those adjustments which are necessary to the establishment of home and family. And then we come to the next period. And this is the period which the ancients associated with the sovereign son itself, career. Here the person has to build his way of life, prepare the problems of survival, uh, employment, profession, also, all of the maturities of mind and emotions which are necessary to the maintenance of a proper civilization or a proper integrity of life. Here we find the child now grown up in what might be termed the golden age ruled by the sun itself. For here is strength, here is courage, here is the long period of career that extends between the end of education and retirement. This is the period in which the world must be faced. And in this facing, it is very important that the growing person shall begin to understand the mistakes that society itself has established. Has established. That we are all in a society that is not in harmony with universal truth, universal order, or divine love. We are in a strange kind of twilight which we have created for ourselves through the constant emphasis upon selfishness. Here we have the fortune hunter, the accumulator, the wealth and fame seeker, all of which, we may say, constitute a general failure as far as the initiation rites are concerned. No one can have enough money to buy entrance to the temple. He must do it, he must make this entrance not by what he has, but by what he is. And if in so doing he has made the choice to depend upon accumulation for survival, he has made a mistake that will have to be paid for sometimes by many years of misfortune. All the way along, however, the planetary cycle is moving him through the degrees of a that will have to be paid for sometimes by many years of misfortune. 
All the way along, however, the planetary cycle is moving him through the degrees of a mystery initiation, a ritual of maturing. After he gets to this period of uh, having attained worldliness in all its many aspects, and along the way undoubtedly accumulating a large number of disappointments, a great deal of sorrow, and terribly disillusioning events, he passes then into the next great cycle. And he passes into the cycle, you might say, of the elder statesman. He now becomes the counselor of others. He now becomes the authority on one thing or another. But most of all, he is presumed to become an authority on the management of his own life. At this stage, the children have grown up. The responsibilities that he had are gradually becoming less, and there is a constantly unfolding realization that there is something more important than this little life that he has been satisfied to waste or use in one way or another. So here comes a little bit of judgment, a little bit of thought, a little search for wisdom, a turning back to religion after a life of materialism. And there is society doing the same thing as it is today, turning back to religion after a great outburst of scientific materialism. Little by little, the mind matures as much as it can. It benefits to whatever measure it can benefit from the experiences of life. But along the way, it has failed largely to accumulate uh, the various details of procedure which would have made it easier. There has been no definite study, no definite consideration until the emergency arose. I remember an emergency of this kind that came to my attention many years ago. A young man in his early 40s with a beautiful family, all the physical needs of life, a workable profession that was honorable and sufficient, dying. I was with him when he passed. He was a complete materialist. So, he said, what, it, 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 before he went, so we had a little talk, and when we finished the talk, he died. But uh, he said, I, why have I no faith? I need faith, but I haven't got it. I don't know what to do. I don't know why I exist. I don't know why I'm going. I'm leaving everything that's dear and near to me. I, have to try, I want to see my children grow up. I want to see my wife happy. But now it's all taken away. There's nothing, and I don't know why. Now, for a man to graduate from a great university, have a successful business and a happy home, and be unable to answer any of those questions is an indictment of our society. It is something that is almost incomprehensible that a person can be called educated and be profoundly ignorant about, ignorant about all the personal values of life. How can a person who knows, as we all know, that we must leave this world, make no preparation for the journey? So before he passed, I said maybe the last words of Socrates would be of some consolation to you. Socrates, after he drank the hemlock, turned for his last words with his disciples. And he said, don't weep for me. Don't mourn me. Don't be sorry for me. Be rather sorry for those who stay behind. But this, I tell you, of all my life, I have looked for answers. I want to know more. I want to understand better. I want to see more clearly. And in a few minutes, I'm going to leave here. And there's only one of two things that can happen. Either I will go to sleep and never wake again, and there will be no Socrates, and no vestige of him, or no end product of him. He will cease completely and entirely. If that is the case, I have no further worry, for I will not exist to worry at all.
The other possibility is that when I go forth, I'm not going to cease. Rather, I am going to come into the presence of many mysteries that I cannot solve in this life. If I do not perish, then I will know I am immortal. If I have a survival and a part of a universe of unknown and invisible principles after death, probably I will understand some of them. Therefore, I will either cease or I will go forth to know the answers to the questions I have sought all my life in this world. Well, I told the young man that. He kind of held my hand for a minute. He said, I think I understand. And he went. So this is the type of problem that we should think about perhaps at this season of the year. We should think about the creation of a way of life which is the dedication of the Christian spirit. We are told clearly that the gift of life is the gift of God. We are told clearly that love took place, flesh, and dwelt among us for the redemption of all that lived. These things are parts of faith that sometimes are closer to children than they are to the adult. But in any event, we are celebrating today the annual birthday of the Divine Son, whether it is spelt with an S-U-N or an S-O-N. It becomes the symbol of infinite life, infinite light, and infinite love. Therefore, this is a very important day. It's not much use for us to go out and make resolutions, because we'll break them in a few days. But we can begin to understand, not placing a penalty upon ourselves, but allowing the self within us to grow a little, to begin to open up, simply because our thoughts are more generous and more kindly, and that we are beginning to realize that happiness is not something we can gain by direct effort. Happiness is a byproduct. It comes as the result of doing things right, living and thinking and loving and hoping in harmony with the divine purpose of things. We live in a universe that is completely lawful. And that law is not only a code of conduct, it is the security of an infinite love. Law is a discipline given to the universe that it may fulfill its proper destiny. And it is the same with us. The disciplines of living are the ways that we gain eternal life. So at this time, we should be perhaps be a little more thoughtful, a little more considerate of these great values, that we should re realize that the return of the Sovereign Son is a new invitation to growth. Just as the little seeds will come out of the earth again and the birds will sing again, so all life will take on the glories of the spring and summer. And these glories in our hearts are not fulfilled simply on the physical plane of natural harvests and so forth. In our lives, these promises of eternal progress, this new opportunity to grow, is the greatest gift that anything can give. This is nothing that can be put in a stocking that will do for us that which a thought of constructive integrities can do for us. It can help us to bridge difficulties and in intervals, and the sharing of our convictions uh, with each other, because we really want to share, is an enrichment for all concerned. Today we are searching for world peace, and in the first day of January we will have another opportunity a year for the searchings out of the ways of peace. The beginning, even today, before Christmas, we are beginning at this instant a new opportunity to preserve all the values that are necessary to the survival of our personal lives and the nation to which we belong. It is all a matter of consecrations, a matter of of not being consecrated to some code of our own. That has been our trouble. 
We have built little mountains of our own convictions. We have decided in our own way, with very arbitrary purposes, what we're going to do and how we're going to think and what's going to happen. This is not it. This is the opportunity that we have to allow ourselves to experience the will of life itself, experience the purpose for which we are intended, and not the purposes that we try to create for ourselves. Every one of us is part of an eternal atom. Every one of us is in some way related to everything else that exists. We are all one great, wonderful being under one eternal power. If we can begin to think about this, see it, and understand it, then maybe we can start a year in which each of us will be more mindful of the good of others and not live completely and entirely for the accomplishment of personal ends. There is the personal which will go down to the darkness with us. There is an impersonal which will rise phoenix-like into the light of a better and more noble existence. Not only are we thinking now of our own present time, but the future that lies ahead. We came into this world with uncertain destinies because of our own natures. We brought with us a load of unfinished business, most of which, unfortunately, was not entirely happy. We come here to pay our debts but also to receive our rewards. There is no such a thing as nothing but punishment. Somewhere along the line, we did something right in the past, therefore something good happens now. But there is inconsistency, uncertainty in our way of life. It is therefore very important for us to begin to live better now because we have to live with ourselves as long as individuality remains, which is quite a time yet. So we have to be true to ourselves now to be able to live with ourselves later. And the more that we build into our consciousness of that which is right and true and beautiful and useful, the better the future will be. So on Christmas today and the Christmas day, the little man with the red coat and the white whiskers comes to a kind of happy reminder. Perhaps this little man with the red suit and the white whiskers is also an extended symbol of the sun that is going to bring us another year of joys. It's going to come from the North Pole, which is pretty good astronomy at that. Very much. Or in the old systems, the uh, wheel of the zodiac was placed with Capricorn at the midheaven and Cancer at the nadiad. Therefore, the little man that comes from the far north can be a symbol of the earth deity of the ancient Egyptians, a little rotund creature that brought the toys to children, because the Egyptians also celebrated Christmas, and they did it as we did, with little stone dolls and little toys and gifts and little presents of clothing and jewelry and things. But this also came from the great north, the symbol of the unknown, the inclination of the plume and helmet of Osiris was the inclination of the earth's axis, exactly as we know it today. So from the north comes the light, the north being in this case the birthplace of the annual sun. So in Capricorn the sun is reborn. It is reborn to shine down over the coming months until finally it reaches the fullness of its summer. Then it begins to retire because it has left behind all that is necessary for the next step in human life, and that is man taking care of himself. Now, how does he do this? A farmer can tell you. When the seasons are right, he plants his grain. When the grain is ripe, he puts the seed away for the next harvest. Then he takes and stores away the food for the winter. Every prudent person is storing something for the winter because he does not wish to consider that he has been improvident. So the individual who stores up his own integrities, who has lived because he does not wish to consider 
that he has been improvident. So the individual who stores up his own integrities, who has lived a little better during the year, who has done a little good to others, has put away something for the winter. For, so that as the light of the common sun is dimmed, the light in our own hearts grows brighter, and we can definitely uh, see and experience the inner light. This the Egyptians also believed, for they believed that when Horus was not visible in the, the great ship of the sun, he was still there. And the Puleus, in his Metamorphosis, the great story of his initiation rite, uh, as translated by Taylor and several others now, uh, the candidate in the mysteries sees the sun shining underneath his feet. This is uh, uh, a peculiar statement connected with the initiation rites. But he, because he has been taken in darkness from the outside world to the darkness of the inner world, but he sees even in the darkness of the inner world that the light is shining beneath his feet. That is, the light is shining from the earth when it is not shining from the heavens. And therefore it is shining from man when it is not shining from nature. And man becomes the sun and becomes the sovereign sun himself and by his own light brings nourishment, life, hope, happiness, growth, security to his own kind. In winter, the individual has his chance to do things. Instead of being required to wait or to hope, or just simply through laziness to consider that he will be taken care of, he comes to a season when he must take care of himself. And the world today is in that season, a season in which we can no longer depend upon the errors of others, or no longer depend upon the corruptions of codes, the light has become a little dim for us now. We are in a winter of our discontent. And in this particular season, the sun, psychologically, is obscured. The sun has gone its eternal way. And me, we must take over the, ban the holding of the light until the next uh, winter solstice period from the summer solstice to the winter solstice becomes our responsibility. It is harvesting and conserving and preserving, and the process is represented by the constellation of Virgo with a sheaf of grain, which is a symbol of putting the harvest away. In the spring, heaven bestows. In the fall, man conserves. Little by little, the whole astronomical universe breaks down into a morality, a morality that has the most perfect evidence that we can have, the only evidence, really. Everything else is conjecture, except that the sun rises, and that also that spring comes. All things are, that are immovable and eternal and inevitable have to become the basis of the building of a useful philosophy of life. If we do not build upon that kind of a foundation, we are in serious trouble. So I'd like to think of the term, as the sun moves northward, that we will all move with it to become part, cooperative parts, so that out of our own hearts, rays of that sun will shine upon a world that is beginning to awaken from the sleep of materiality and to come again into the light of the love of God. Thank you very much.